you're getting this. We are live. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Secret Nature of Matter webinar on June 5th. My name is Jeff Affleck. I'll be your co-host today. And of course, Richard Gordon is going to be presenting to you for about the next hour, and then we'll be taking Q&A. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you in just a moment, Richard. I'll just read your bio for those who okay. haven't got to know you as much yet. Richard Gordon has over 40 years of experience in the field of holistic health and is considered a visionary and pioneer of energy healing. He's the best-selling author of four books. Um, those are Quantum Touch, The Power to Heal, which is now in 17 languages, Quantum Touch 2.0, and uh, also Your Healing Hands. And now, of course, The Secret Nature of Matter is uh, officially a best-selling book. As a developer of Quantum Touch, a powerful but easy to learn energy healing method and founder of the Quantum Touch organization, Richard has spoken and taught worldwide at medical centers, conferences, chiropractic colleges. And he's been on the faculty at Hartwood Institute and the Holistic Health Institute. Richard is always exploring new ways to make healing simple, powerful, accessible, reliable, easy, and fun for people of all ages. Uh, besides Quantum Touch, he's also developed the Self-Created Health, a potent system to help people rapidly find and release the emotional causes of illness. And Richard considers his new book, The Secret Nature of Matter, to be his most important work to date. The implications of the book have the potential to shift many of the world's most fundamental limiting beliefs. And you'll be hearing more about that today. This work opens us up to a new world of possibilities. And in his spare time, Richard creates digital art, he plays golf, and he lives with his cats, Debbie and Enzo in Santa Monica, California. So thank you, Richard, I'll turn it over to you. That's a long intro, thank you so much. Hey everybody, I'm so glad you're here. I appreciate all of you coming on board to uh, learn more about these discoveries and the new book. This is what it actually looks like. This is the, the real deal, The Secret Nature of Matter. And um, so I'll be honest with you. 18, 19 months ago, if somebody had told me what it was that was going to be in this book, I really wouldn't have believed it possible. I would not have thought that these things could be, <laughs> but sure enough, it happened. And it all started on uh, Thanksgiving in 2005. So that's a little while ago. Oh, it's my cat is attacking me here. Um, and what happened was, at the Thanksgiving dinner, my friend Daniel said something to me that was rather provocative. He said that he discovered that if you make a movie of yourself doing a healing session, like a quantum touch session, he practiced quantum touch, he said that the people watching the video actually received a healing session. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's crazy. How could that possibly be? I didn't, didn't think that was possible. And he said, well, test it out. Try it yourself. So I tested it but at first I thought well what can I do to actually test something like this and I came up with an idea and the idea was a rather simple one the idea was that you know if you were to try to measure somebody's headache or, people can always say they got better but you don't really know if it was just the suggestion that caused it and I wanted to know if it was more than just the suggestion so what I did was I went to a technique that I had learned uh, over the many years. And I'll tell you how it came about, this technique came about, because this technique evolved for a long time. It was back in 19, the summer of 1978 when I first met a gentleman named Robert Rasmussen, this very large elderly man who had developed a technique that later became quantum touch. And he was made, telling these tall tales, and I really couldn't believe what he was saying. And one of the things that he said is, oh, yeah, I just touch bones, and they'll move back into alignment with a light touch. And I thought, yeah, right. Well, he was demonstrating on my girlfriend, and she had a major scoliosis. And he just touched her hips, and the hips rolled before my eyes. And he, the shoulders moved, and the occipital bones at the back of the head just rolled into alignment. 
I was dumbstruck. I couldn't believe my eyes. So that was one of the techniques that we teach in the basic quantum touch workshop is how you can actually see something that's considered physiologically impossible happening in moments. Then about seven, eight years ago, I discovered that if I meditate on a bone behind the nose and eyes called the sphenoid bone, you can spontaneously get the hips to move back into alignment and the cranial bones to move. So now I have a pretty good test because when a person is standing and the hips are twisted, this is called pelvic torsion, that's the technical name for it. If the hips are twisted and you meditate, you can actually get them to align. And the cranial bones are even more unlikely to move. The uh, Gray's anatomy says that by the time you're an adult, all the cranial bones form a skull cap that is incapable of moving. It's one solid bone as a skull cap. I think it's called a calvarum. I may get that, and that might be not exactly the right word, but it's something very close to that. And the cranial bones can't move. But what I found was that if I meditated on the sphenoid bone, as I taught, I think in chapter 17 or 19 of my book, Quantum Touch 2.0, The New Human, what you can do is you can get the bones to spontaneously move in the back of the head. So that was going to be my test. So what I did was I first tried tried making a movie of myself doing a healing session. So I got my, my phone and I did a selfie movie of myself meditating. It wasn't a very exciting movie. Uh, and I showed people the movie and it actually caused them to shift the pelvic torsion in seconds. And I was astounded. Then I thought, well, what are the limits of this? How does it work? So I made a screenshot of the movie. Just took the picture and showed people the picture of me meditating, and that did it. And then I had a breakthrough. I was sitting in a coffee shop, and I had just played golf in the morning. I reached in my pocket, and there was a golf tee in my sweater. And I thought, you know, what would happen if I meditate on this golf tee and give it the energy and information of untwisting pelvic and occipital torsion. Oh, by the way, I've abbreviated that to SPA, Spontaneous Postural Alignment. So SPA now means pelvic and occipital torsion being, being released. So would it cause that spontaneous postural alignment? I meditated on the golf tee. I measured somebody at another, t you know, sitting with me, and the hips were really uneven. I handed them the golf tee, and it straightened out their hips. Oh my God, what have I come across? So then I immediately started to think, wait a second, why is this? So I, I started finding random objects just made of any kind of material I could think of. I tried plastic, rubber, metal, uh, stones, I tried, uh, paper, I tried a leaf, I tried every kind of random object I could test, and they all worked. Then I had to then do some tests and find out, am I deceiving myself? Because, you know, they say the easiest thing for a scientist to do is to fool himself. So my friend Paul worked at a, uh, a Whole Foods market, and he has a massage table there. And he has lots of people coming by, chatting with him or wanting sessions. So I went over to see him and we chatted a little while. And I gave him a coin that I had meditated on. I was a quarter. And I said, take this quarter and put it on a shelf. And he put the coin on a shelf. Then I'd measure somebody who came into the market and say, oh, yeah, the hips are really uneven. You see, it's very easy to see if they're uneven. It's like putting your hands on a ledge, like feeling like putting them on a table. And if it stops here, it's uneven. If it stops there, it's level. So it's a yes or no answer. Like, is the light switch pointing up or pointing down? There's no ambiguity about it. So I measured somebody. I walked around the corner. Paul would either give them the quarter and take it back or not give them the quarter. 
And when I arrived and I measured them, within half a second, I knew whether or not he had given them the coin or not. And I was right 10 out of 10 times. So, no, it did not look like I was deceiving myself. So then I just, cont- I, by this point, I started keeping a journal because I realized I'm on to something really interesting now. And I want to understand all the parameters of what is making this work. So what was the next? Okay, I, I got some water. I meditated on the water. And when a person took a sip of the water, it untwisted their posture. But what would happen if I boiled the water? So I got these little vials. I boiled water for 10 minutes. I let it cool, poured a little water into a vial. And when I handed people the vial, it would untwist their posture. Oh my God. But the water that had evaporated on the top of the lid, that did not cause the untwisting to occur. So when it went from water to vapor, it somehow had erased the information. What about water that turns to ice? Now I can't explain this, but the water that turned to ice also erased the information. What about ice that turns to water? Well, that held the information. I, I have no explanation for which, why these things happen this way, but maybe somebody will come along in time and be able to explain it better. So then I tried other experiments. I tried to meditate to erase the information in an object. I tried to smudge the object to see if I could get the information out. Th- this didn't work at all. You know, they say, well, just, just put the, the sage smoke and it'll clear it doesn't do anything. Then I tried uh, getting brutal and I took a hammer and smashed a a coin just until it was the smithereens. It was was just still worked. It's all crinkled up, still worked. What about microwaving water? Didn't matter. Still held the energy intention. Deleting the information is very difficult. I tried taking a photo of me meditating. No, actually, no, this was a photo of a coin. And it worked. Then I took that photo and I reduced it in Photoshop. I took out the color. I made it really small and I printed it on my printer. It still worked. So I'll tell you a few more experiments. We'll go on to some other interesting things. I tried to see if I could do something in the realm of homeopathy. So I went to an office where there were a lot of people and I had access to a kitchen. So I brought a whole bunch of bottles with me. I filled them all up with water. I brought them all to a table across the room. I tried to be really careful with this. And I meditated on bottle number one and I put my consciousness in bottle number one. Then I brought a dropper with two drops and put it in dropper bottle number two and shook it. As they say, they call it percussing. And I shook it and then I moved it across the room and I took a dropper and I put a couple drops in bottle number three and did, the, did it over and over again until I had gone through all the bottles. And by the time the water had been diluted, I calculated about one in 10 trillion parts I brought the final bottle out to someone. First, I measured them, make sure nothing had happened, handed them the bottle, and they were untwisted. The, the man was aligned. The spontaneous postural alignment had occurred. So these are a few of the experiments, but I kept trying new things. And one of the things that I tried was I met a woman who did massage work, but she didn't know anything about energy healing. So. As an experiment, I meditated on her finger. And if she, so we we walked around and she would touch people, just thump like that, and it would untwist their posture. And I tested her two weeks later, it was still working. Then I didn't run into her for another year. And I said, let's test it out. And she said, okay. 
And she touched somebody with a finger and it untwisted their, their posture. So you could actually charge a finger. I'm telling you, this is like crazy stuff. I didn't, like I said, I would not have believed this even a year and a half ago as I've been doing this stuff. What about a tiny object? I, I charged a, a grain of, of salt or sugar. Worked perfectly, it didn't matter the size. I had somebody put intention on a dot on a piece of paper. Anyway, it goes on and on. I actually ran a total of 58 experiments, but I think perhaps the most, one of the most important ones occurred between experiment 37 and 38 of the 58 experiments. I went into a cafe and they had a long table. And on that table, uh, first off I met a woman who had a very easy pelvic torsion to measure, it was very obvious. And I had her standing with her back to the table. And I laid out about 15 pennies behind her and the pennies were spaced three or four inches apart. So there's this long line of pennies and her back was to the table so she couldn't see what I was doing. And then I meditated on penny number one, which was right behind her. And when I meditated on penny number one, I measured her again to make sure that she was still holding the misalignment and she was. Okay, now we're ready for the experiment. I reached way down three and a half, four feet away and I picked up penny number 15 and I handed it to her. And as soon as I did, she was untwisted. And I got, I got upset. I got a little upset. I, what the, why is this happening? Because I only meditated on penny number one, but penny number 15 was working. So I came up with an interesting theory. And the theory was maybe, well, my first theory was that maybe the energy had moved across all the pennies, kind of the way that fire moves across gasoline. But when the more I thought about it, the more that didn't make any sense to me because that would mean that the table was charged, that the walls, the floors, the windows, everybody in the cafe, the whole boulevard outside, all the people on the earth, <laughs> Well, that obviously hadn't happened. So therefore, I needed a new theory. And the new theory that I came up with is something that I call uh, conscious entanglement. And I got to test it the next day. I was at a, um, an expo, and I met a couple women who had a very obvious pelvic torsion, very twisted. And what I did was, I didn't want to use any of my own change because it's suspect, because I've meditated on these coins. I use coins a lot because they're so easy. You always get a new one and you can always use it very quickly to test things out. And what I did was I borrowed a few coins, maybe five or six, and I just looked at them and I joined them together in my mind. This is what I'll call conscious entanglement. I stared at them. I see all the coins in my hand, I see them all, they're all here, I see every one of them. That's it. Then I put them down and I reached over, picked up a coin, handed it to each of the women just randomly. And then I reached in a pocket, pulled out a charged coin that I'd meditated on previously. I just tapped one of the coins on the table, measured the two women and they were both aligned. Oh my God. So that was my first experience of what I'll call conscious entanglement. And then I ran the experiments in every variety and way. And by the way, all of these experiments I did multiple times with multiple people just to make sure that I wasn't fooling myself and to make sure this was actually working the way I had intended. So I had other people entangle objects. I had some people who were entangled and unentangled. I just ran a whole series of experiments. Uh, I tested this out again when I spoke at the University of Hong Kong and the University of Macau, and then later in uh, Tokyo at three demonstrations. And I'd have 15, 20 people on stage. And what I had them do was I had them all hold hands.
because what is holding hands? It's an entanglement. Everybody holding someone else's hands knows that they're touching somebody else. So they create this chain of entanglement. And then I just took a charge coin from my pocket and I just brushed a woman's hair at the beginning of the line, just a few hairs, just thick, like that, just the smallest touch. And every single person had the pelvic torsion untwisted. And by the way, I have shown this to chiropractors, professional chiropractors, and they are completely blown away by this. And if you're interested, uh, I put up a couple videos on YouTube um, that I'll talk about in a, in a little bit that show people's reactions to the cranial bones moving. And those are, um, that was a, a later invention that came out of this. I might as well talk about that now. Uh, I just, what I did, once I realized that the conscious entanglement was a real powerful thing that worked effectively, I decided to create a group entangled pendant. So I created what we call the, the quantum touch pendant. And that's what these things look like, the gold and silver. And when I first created them, I first had them manufactured. What I did was I spent a long time entangling them all together, joining them together in my mind so they'll always be connected. Then I ran my best healing energy into the pendant. And once I had done that, I, I went about and gave a gift away of one of these pendants to my top 50 instructors around the world with instructions. And the instructions were to put their best healing energy into it themselves. And before we knew it, we had pretty much sold out. Oh, one other thing I put into the pendant was the information about untwisting the hips and occiput. Now, let me just back up a second. I talk way too much about untwisting posture. 99% of what interests people about quantum touch is uh, reducing pain, reducing inflammation, uh, accelerating the healing process, whatever they might be. Uh, these are the things that really excite people. And we just did a clinical study with 41 people who had high levels of pain. They had 50 different pain conditions. The pain was at least five or higher on a scale of 10. Most people in the study had been suffering from fibromyalgia, various forms of arthritis, or from a major accident. And the result was from a single quantum touch session, a 67.4% reduction in pain. So that's what quantum touch is mostly about. It's about helping people heal faster. But for the purpose of my new book, The Secret Nature of Matter, I wanted to see you know, if we could handle the pelvic torsion. So that's why I'm talking about that so long. Well, the quantum touch pendant completely surprised me because I put into it the information of untwisting pelvic torsion and now we're seeing healing coming from these pendants that I would never have imagined or anticipated. For example, uh, when it first happened, I was at a retreat in Cancun, Mexico. And I'm sitting with this fellow from Italy and he's explaining to me that he hasn't been able to breathe through his right sinus since he was uh, about 15 years old. And he's probably in his mid to late 30s. And so I handed him two pendants like this. And I said, well, just hold them on both sides of your nose. And he did. And he held them there. And within four or five minutes, he, he said he was breathing through his right sinus again. I was as surprised as anybody. Then after that, uh, a couple women sitting there wanted to see if it would help them with their TMJ. And after four or five minutes each, their TMJ opened up. And another woman had pain under her eyes and her pain disappeared. And since then, we've been seeing all kinds of things happening. One fellow told me that he has badly sprained his thumb doing jujitsu. So for about 20 minutes, he held the pendant over his thumb. He thought that his thumb was going to be weak and in pain for at least a month. But the next morning when he woke up, his, his, his uh, 
thumb was fine. I was taking a walk with my friend Jamie, and he told me when we first met that he had stubbed his toe so badly in the morning that it was all swollen. And we took a walk, and then at some point during the walk, he said, you know, it's getting to be too painful for me to go on. I said, well, take your pendant, I'd given him a pendant, and just lay it on top of your toe. So he did, and within seconds, he said, oh my God, my, my toe is completely tingling and vibrating. I said, yeah, it's, it's experiencing some of the healing energy that people have been putting into the pendant. Within three minutes, he said he's ready to walk again, and another two or three minutes later, he said he couldn't even feel his toe. So this is just a real surprising element of the pendants is that it seems to be helping people to accelerate the healing process. And, uh, and it's funny, when I take this thing off, I really feel different than when I'm wearing it. But I wanna talk a little bit about the surprise that I felt after I'd completed all the experiments in the book, which might have been called Experiment 59, but I didn't call it that. What happened was I had the pendants and if I handed, somebody said, let me look at that. So I'd hand them the pendant to look at. And what I noticed was just handing a person the pendant did not cause the hips to spontaneously untwist or the occiput. And, but if I took the same pendant and just had any intention whatsoever, even the slightest intention, I just touched them with it with the intent of causing SPA, spontaneous postural alignment, just a little touch, that would cause it. So handing it didn't work, but having the intent made it work. So this is a whole field that we're gonna be looking at soon to understand how much intent and what kinds of intent can people use with their pendant? Because now we have about 3,000 or more people, probably more than 3,000 now, who are actively using their pendant. So what we have is almost all these people have been studying quantum touch for some time. And they're putting their energy and their intent and their healing into the pendant. So every person's energy is like a different fragrance of flower or a bouquet of flowers. And so we're getting this incredibly wide variety of information coming to these things. And to the best of my knowledge, this may be the very first group entangled talisman on the planet. There may have never been another one ever. And every person who receives a pendant, what I tell them is, the first thing to do with it is connect with it. It's not just a physical object. Put your deepest love, gratitude, intent. And we're now adding new programs for people to put into the dependent. And some of the programs are, we're having people, they have been putting their best healing energy in for a long time, but now we're having them put their, their special gifts in. Some per woman says, I mean, I'm, incredibly compassionate, I just care about everybody. Someone else has a deep level of uh, ability to, through grit, can stay with things when it, the going gets tough and they just get tougher. Someone else puts nurturing in, someone else puts patience in, people are putting their gifts in. But we're get, we've got a whole lot of new programs we're gonna put in in the future, such as people's special abilities, like being able to have photographic memory, uh, being able to learn languages and so forth, uh, read you know, 5,000, 10,000 words a minute and, and all these kinds of things. So there's gonna be a lot of evolution. And if you wanna see uh, some demonstrations of people being shocked and amazed when they experience the pendant, uh, go to YouTube and look up quantum touch pendant demo. And what I do is I have people feeling the back of their head after I'd measured them and I'd say, I'd say, which side feels higher to you? And they say, oh, my, my right side's much higher. And I go, okay. Now, I just touch them with the pendant for a split second and say, now lift your thumbs and put them right back. And they do. And you see these reactions that start becoming redundant where people just break out laughing like, how, and they say, how is this possible? <laughs> or this is real magic or things. It's very entertaining to watch people 
respond to the uh, dependence. So where from here? Well, the first thing that occurs to me is that what we're really talking about is new laws of matter and consciousness. Now, the scientific community has become completely, I'll say addicted or infused with the idea that the only things that are real can be weighed, measured, or put into a scientific formula. This is known as scientific materialism. And so if you can't weigh it, measure it, or put it into mathematics, it's not real, it doesn't exist. But we're showing that there are phenomena that actually do exist that do not fit the old laws of physics. And it suggests that, first off, psychic abilities do exist, the mind is not confined to the brain, that focused energy and intent can have a physical impact on people and matter, that all matter can hold energy and intent. And I've uh, come up with a new sci very uh, uh, an important scientific phrase. This is it's called, uh, I would suggest that all matter is actually um, subatomic God stuff. That's a very scientific term, God stuff. But that's what it is. It's all spiritual energy, intention in the form of matter. Because matter is all able to hold this stuff. And that matter can instantly transfer intent to people and objects. And that conscious entanglement is a real phenomenon. When you join objects together in your mind, it can actually have an impact on other people. And so this suggests there's a, a philosophy in science that's being held by, uh, was, um, by various people. It's called panpsychism. And one of the proponents of it is uh, David Chalmers. And he suggests that there's two problems in consciousness, what he calls the hard problem and the easy problem. The easy problem isn't easy, but it's more about if you get stuck by a pin, why your nerve will respond and you will react to it and what parts of the brain may be having an automatic reaction or why light will affect your brain and cause you to have stimulus and perhaps even perceive imagery. That's called the easy problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is why do we have such rich subjective experiences? Why is chocolate taste good? Why do we love one another? Why do we hate? Why do we get angry or, or sad or joyful? That's what he calls the hard problem of consciousness. And as he's explored this, this question of consciousness, he has actually arrived at a conclusion that is opposed to what he formally believes, which is that the materialistic view of reality, but he now believes that every subatomic particle is able to hold some rudimentary element of self-consciousness. And my experiments would actually support that notion that physical objects can hold energy and intent. So this is, this is so exciting to me that we could actually have an impact on the scientific community and show them. So what about science? Well, I've already done the first double-blind experiment validating the points that I've made in the book. And the way we did this was very elaborate, and we're gonna repeat this with much higher controls. And Dr. Dean Radin of the uh, Institute of Noetic Science and Dr. Gary Schwartz of the University of Arizona are aware of my research. And when we repeat it again with much tighter controls and succeed again, I should add, then they're gonna be interested in replicating the experiment with the intent to try to make it fail. And if it still works, they're going to get behind it and this thing will gain some traction. So what did we do in the experiment? We had a laser measuring device. We put hands on the person's hips where, and get people who are 
thin enough or don't have enough extra padding where when you touch the hip bone, you really feel like you're, you're just touching a flat surface, it's like a table. And we have a stick coming off the finger with a laser measuring device to a point on the floor, and we take a series of measurements. And what we saw was that in the measuring of the distance from the hip to the floor, the control group, we had a margin of error of about two and a half millimeters, about that much, which is pretty good for measuring hips. And in the test group, they moved about 11 millimeters. So that was a massive difference between the controls and the test. But we're gonna do it again with much tighter controls. We spent many hours working out the best way to get these measure, measuring uh, measurements done, and I'm very excited about. But when we realize on a more personal level that our love has a physical impact on people and on objects, now the scientists would tell you that your love is just an epiphenomena of brain activity, or it's a behavior, it's a greeting card, <laughs> It's, a, it's an action that you take to show somebody that you care and that somehow I perceive that you care based on the look in your eyes or your, your behavior or things of that nature. And I'm suggesting that love is a real powerful force that all the animals on earth recognize. And you see videos on YouTube from time to time showing animals that have never in thousands of generations had anybody be affectionate like a, a an eel in in the ocean or a sea tortoise or some land animal like a tortoise on land and you you give it affection and food and you stroke it and they they start acting like a pussycat it's amazing because love is the universal frequency and all creatures all animals respond to this frequency. So when somebody puts their love into the pendant, they're putting those frequencies of vibration in. And when you choose to engage with your pendant and you look at it and you connect with it and you receive what's there, you actually experience some healing. So one of the questions that's bound to come up is, uh, well, what if somebody puts their their suffering and their self-pity and their pain and their grief into the pendant. Well, think about this. Why are you connecting to the pendant? Are you connecting to engage in their grief? You're connecting to feel the love and the healing. And besides, love is millions of times more powerful than is the suffering. There is no dark switch on the wall to flood the room, as uh, Esther Hicks says, with inky darkness. There's only a light switch, and you can turn on the light or remove the light, but you can't flood the room with darkness. The pendants are holding so much energy and light, it's incredible. So a couple other small points, and then we'll get into like a group discussion and talk about all this fun stuff, but I'm kind of doing a quick download here. That's my cat's tail went across the screen. Um, one idea is that uh, there is this idea going around in science that one day, and it's a very popular idea, and you see it in so many movies, I won't even list them all, that machines are going to become self-conscious, self-aware machine. And is that really a person inside there? Well, there's this test called the Turing test. And Alan Turing, in about 1950, devised this concept, this thought experiment. If you were talking to a computer with a keyboard, and would you know if you're talking to a person and if the machine is capable of fooling you, then the machine is conscious? Well, that's not a very good test because in my opinion, it's only a test to see if a program can fool you into thinking there's a person there. So it says, hi, how are you? Oh, I had a bad day and you, what went wrong? And they're talking to you or whatever. That doesn't mean it knows itself. Uh, it just means that it fooled you. So they have this Turing test where you, People are talking to someone in another room, and they try to guess if it's a machine in the other room or a person. And my idea of a Turing test is far more sophisticated, and I think it's impeccable. And the idea is very simply this. If a machine in another room is capable of causing SPA, spontaneous postural alignment, 
without any human intervention, I will grant that there is a consciousness inside that machine that is capable of a lot of human things like imagination, desire, expectation, intention, projection, access to life force energy. If it can do that, if it can do this very simple thing that, by the way, I teach everybody how to do this in chapter seven of the new book. So you can test all the experiments in this book, all 58 of them yourself, and you will be able to then charge objects and work with objects yourself to be able to replicate my work. So I am under the firm belief that the evolution of consciousness involves compassion. And you think about the animals that we most adore, the most cherished animals that we respect the most. We see, the ele we see elephants expressing tremendous compassion for one another, grieving the death of another elephant or helping the baby out of the, out of the water and so forth. We see compassion in bonobos, especially. We see it in dolphins, cats, dogs, many, many animals. Um, some birds have shown compassion. And, we, and they've even found cases where rats have shown compassion. And, and by the way, I've seen a few cases where politicians show compassion too. So the evolution of consciousness involves the ability to not only care about the suffering of another, but to do something to relieve that suffering. And that is the whole point of quantum touch. It's about learning how to move the life force energy through your body, linking it with the breathing techniques. We do not need to have any belief system. There's, we're not saying yay or nay to any religion. We're just using breathing, body awareness, love, compassion, intent, desire to assist other people. We raise our vibration high. We then help their tissue match our vibration, come up to the same level, and then their body and spiritual intelligence does the healing. We like to say that the definition of a healer is someone who was sick and got well, and a great healer was someone who was very sick and got well quickly. So um, perhaps we should uh, move on to some uh, questions about things, but that's my quick little overview rant of my book and some of the stuff that's in there. There's a lot more in there too, but this is some of the highlights that I'm most excited about. Wonderful. Do you hear me, Richard? Yeah, hey, I do. Yeah, I, I've, I've got my video off, so I think we'll just leave you on. You're far better looking. And I don't know about that. I've, got, I've been answering a few of the, uh, the very straightforward questions as we go, but I have, we have about 19 right now in the, in the queue for questions. Yeah, let's, let's go for one. Uh, so I'll go from the ones that were asked very early on. William asked, uh, a couple of weeks ago before discovering QT2, I did some energy work with tangible hand energy balls. Now I have uncontrolled energy pulse or wave through my hand, arms, and shoulders, and don't seem to be able to make um, my, uh, sorry, don't, don't seem able to consciously move body awareness or energy anywhere else. Is there a problem here? Uh, just what play with it. it what, this, you see, when people start off moving awareness to their body, it often feels like it gets stuck in places. And when I started doing it, I had difficulty moving it uh, through parts of my chest and my face. And there are places that are very easy to move it through based on how much awareness you have and parts that are very difficult. And with practice, everything just opens up. So just, even if you can't feel it, just do the breathing and sweeping exercises and just keep feeling, just imagine it going through the parts and bring your awareness through those parts. Some people can't feel it at all and they can still do extraordinarily good healing work. So I wouldn't worry about it at all. Just keep practicing and working with people and your abilities will open up very well over time. All right, and just a reminder, if you have a question, hit the Q&A button rather than typing a question in the chat. We're gonna go through the Q&A. Yeah. Um, Louise asks, she's been an occupational therapist and mm -hmm. um, now as a manager for a residential home for the elderly, can she yes. utilize 
her knowledge to the benefit of her residents or how oh, yeah. yes absolutely we've seen extraordinary work by uh people using quantum touch for helping the elderly and the infirmed and in hospitals i was just reminded uh yesterday one of our nurse practitioners working at a hospital was working with post-surgical care patients and the doctor said you have to stop doing that and she said why he said, well, we can no longer predict how much pain medication to give the patients. <laughs> so it's just the wrong, wrong facility that had their values in the wrong place. They, didn't, they weren't selling enough pain medication. So uh, she, had, she was told to stop doing quantum touch. But no, we've seen fabulous work on people who are infirmed. And even in hospice care, I've got some amazing experiences working with uh, people or hearing stories from uh, people in hospice as well. Okay, great. Uh, three questions here about when you, uh, r relating to when you meditate on something. So Leah asked, uh, do you visualize anything specific when you meditate to infuse an object? Yes. Um, and, and I'll ask the other one's question because they're very similar. Uh, do you say anything specific when you meditate? And then someone else, Marie, says, what do you mean by meditating on Okay, it? all right. So in the, in the book, I'll teach you how to focus your awareness to be able to cause the spontaneous posture alignment. What I'm essentially doing is I'm giving a crash quantum touch course in this book where I'm showing you how to move awareness through your body, how to link it with your breathing. So what the meditation is, is feeling the sensations inside your body and linking it with your breathing. So for instance, if you were to feel your finger right now and you breathe deeply into your finger and look at your finger and put all your awareness in your finger breathe, and just breathe as if you're inhaling, exhaling through the finger. Does your finger begin to tingle or vibrate a little bit? Does it buzz? Does it, um, can you feel more sensation? There's a pulse. Any sensation is the right one because that's what you're feeling. And what we learn to do is we learn to get our whole body feeling like that finger in waves. And then when we, and then we learn to link with various breathing patterns. And that's the elementary element of quantum touch. That's the foundation of it. Once we've done that, I show you how to bring your awareness to a bone behind the nose and eyes called the sphenoid bone which touches all the other cranial bones. And by the way, it was the first bone in the embryo. The, the uh, sphenoid and the heart are the first parts of the embryo, and it's a really important part. And then how to link it in that meditation so that you turn it and cause the hips and the occiput to spontaneously untwist. And then you can replicate all my experiments. So when I say meditate, I'm only talking about shifting your awareness going a little bit quiet inside, not super quiet, but just quiet enough to bring your awareness through your body with your breath and then to project your awareness into the sphenoid bone. It's not a great secret except that the world doesn't know that it's real or possible. And it's one of my great delights is showing skeptics and showing people who are hostile or belligerent or arrogant that the, the reality actually works in ways that they hadn't anticipated. By the way, this is Devi. She wanted to come by and say hello. Mm -hmm. So she's here now. Uh, all right. And uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're coming in faster than we can answer them. Okay, well, let's get, we, got, we got a lot of time, yeah. so we can do this. A um, couple of people asked if, uh, if these techniques work with animals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we had one story come in about the pendant that a cat, was born with a bent tail. <laughs> they ran the pendant down the cat's spine to the end of the tail a number of times, and the cat's tail straightened out. I was begging for photographs. I haven't gotten them, but that was, uh, that was the story. Mm. And yeah, these, um, all the quantum touch techniques work on plants, animals. Uh, you can change the taste of some drinks. We had an 11-year-old in one class who when I used to teach class, I'd bring a little bit of the cheapest wine and I'd let it get stale overnight before I'd serve it. That's the kind of get host I am, I suppose. 
And what I do is I have these little Dixie cups, these little tiny little cups, and we put like a little bit in each cup, and then I'd have people take two cups, put one on in their hands and one under their ta- under their chair, and they'd run the energy into the one in their hands for four or five minutes, and they'd sip it, and they'd see what the taste was like. And then I'd have them reach under the chair and taste the one that hadn't been charged. And the one that had been charged was kind of mellow and flat and boring. And the one that hadn't been charged was blah, was bitter and terrible. And people would have a very strong reaction and they'd be so surprised. And some people could actually make the charged one taste sweet. And they'd say, mine is sweet, let me try. And they'd taste each other's wine. It was amazing how people could do that. But yeah, we can work on animate and animate on objects, on food, on, on cats and animals, birds, whatever. Mm-hmm. We've had so many stories of animal healings. And by the way, if you're interested, we're soon going to be publishing, I don't know exact date, but we're gathering together as many quantum touch stories as we can find. And they're going through very light editing and we're going to have them hyperlinked by subject. And so people can look up any subject that they want to know about and, uh, and see what kind of stories we have. And we, we used to have pages on bur- people with burns and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, the healing work is very exciting. And uh, that's what led me, of course, to all these discoveries. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, we, we had a number of questions from uh, people about specific conditions. Perhaps yes. To address that. What happens with specific conditions is there's no guarantee any one person with a particular condition will get well. And there's about 50,000 conditions. So I could probably spend the rest of my life talking about all the different kinds of conditions. What we generally see is we make progress on most things. And I can't really comment on anybody's uh, particular condition. But when we get the, the list of stories together, you'll be able to see how other people have responded to the various kinds of conditions. Okay, great. Um, Michael was asking, uh, will the all silver pendant be available? Yes, we're actually manufacturing, we had one for a little while and uh, we sold out and then the manufacturer stopped making them. And we're in the process I should be getting a sample in in the next couple of weeks of the new silver pendant. We decided to make it a little bit smaller, a little more, a little more elegant in size, and um, so we're going to be having that come in. We some women were saying that this was just a little on the large size for their taste, so we're just bringing it down a little bit. It'd still be a nice size for men too, but uh, yeah, we're making an 100% silver pendant, and we're even exploring making a uh, a gold, a solid gold one too, maybe with real gemstones in it. So we're we're exploring that now. I don't think the solid silver pendant is going to work any better than the one that has. Uh, we have a, a silver and gold plating process. That's a vacuum plating that takes three days to put on. It's the best one we could find. So we really made an effort, and these didn't have to be made with a copper base, but they're made with copper. I could have made these pendants with old cigarette butts encased in plastic, and it probably would have worked just as well. <laughs> because it was the energy that made it work, not the components. It wasn't the sp- beautiful spiral design or Swarovski crystal in the middle. We, we made it as attractive as we could because we know people like to wear beautiful things, but it didn't have to be. We could have, could have made it out of um, old broken pieces of plastic toys, and it would have still worked as well. <laughs> Jesse is asking, uh, does the untwisting hold? And if so, how long typically? Well, typically for the rest of your life. And what happens is when I first was teaching Quantum Touch and in the Quantum Touch, the Power to Heal book, which um, man, what, I'm so happy about that book. It's, it's really helped so many people. But I didn't know about the sphenoid bone when I wrote that book. And so when you touch a person's hips and you align their hips, it only lasts for two or three days, kind of like a chiropractic adjustment would do. Then when I finally learned about the sphenoid bone and 
meditating on the sphenoid bone, once it goes back in place, that person, you see, when the sphenoid is out of alignment, reflexively, the cranial bones are out of alignment and the hips are out. And once it goes back in, they, they just come right to within anywhere from a quarter, like a half a second to two or three seconds, and they're just in. And I've checked people many years later, and they're still holding that alignment. So once you've created that, gotten that alignment, it really does hold well. Now, one of the big questions that come up for people is that whether or not um, quantum touch will work all the time, and it won't. It, it clearly won't. About 85, 90% of the time, we're going to get some really good results that people are going to be very happy with, but they don't always hold. And when they don't hold, there's another system that I developed that really helps it to work, and that's called self-created health. And the self-created health helps people find and release the emotional cause. That the, and then when they've released it sufficiently and gone through the forgiveness process, not only do the symptoms often disappear, but people will feel grateful for having had the condition because it showed how they had stopped loving. And that is the most mind-blowing thing because they thought the condition was bothering them tremendously, and it was. But when they got to the painful part of love that hadn't been fulfilled, the getting back to the love was so much more valuable than the pain had been painful. It was a reminder from your higher self of how you stopped loving. So the conclusion was that the body has the ability to be sick, not as a dysfunction, but as a communication from your own higher consciousness. And by learning how to first decipher what the emotional meaning is of the condition, it's not paint by numbers, it's very, very individual, and it's more like dream analysis than uh, paint by number, where we find exactly what it is, release those emotions, move through the remorse of having hurt yourself and others for having held this problem, go through the forgiveness, and on the other side of the forgiveness is this explosive overwhelming self-love that you can't contain, which becomes love of God, God is all that is, infinite, beyond, beyond, and oh, by the way, the symptom disappeared. But that's, that's where it all leads. And so that's been taught around the world many times now, and uh, we're very excited about people who choose to get into energy healing and then discover that they can also work on the emotional levels. And so that's, that's a whole other avenue that's available and really worth knowing about. Great. Um, yeah, Dirk's asking, uh, if the, and I, I'll actually, I'll, I'll answer this, Richard, uh, are the pendants available in this moment? So yes, they are, Dirk. Um, if you haven't ordered a copy of Richard's new book yet, the best thing to do is order the book at thesecretnatureofmatter.com. And then after you order the book, you'll receive a promotion code that will give you $30 off the regular price of the pendant and we'll provide you with the link. So if you've already ordered Richard's book, you will have already received that uh, link where you can order the pendant. So thank you, Dirk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. So many questions, my goodness. Good. Well, let's, yeah. let's hang out and, and go through yeah, them. That's great. Um, yeah. you know, so many of them are, are about specific conditions, which we've already addressed. Um, okay, actually, here's, here's one that came in earlier. So you've been waiting a long time. Um, how can someone who's ultra sensitive block or transform EMFs such from Wi-Fi and phones and so on. Is there any advice on that? Yeah. Um, it's a good question, and I have not suffered that myself, so I'm not the best person to answer that question. But some people have been finding that the pendant has helped them feel stronger in EMF fields. So mm -hmm. that's just an idea that might help. Okay. Great. And, um, Barbara, also, oh. um, there's some uh, sheets or parts of sheets that you can put like in your bed or under your desk and you plug the grounding part into the socket and that can help a lot with EMF when you're at home. So you can put this sheet on the floor, you can put it in your bed so your feet are on it when you're in bed and that'll ground you while you're sleeping and that can help a lot with EMF. And I, I actually got one of these grounding sheets. It's just, it's only about that wide 
and it just goes around where my feet will be in the bed and it's it's good to ground yourself while you're sleeping yeah um so an anonymous person asks i am new to quantum touch and to the pendant are the experiments in the book dependent on having a pendant are the experiments what are the experiments in the book dependent on them having oh, no 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 not at all what you can do is i teach you how to meditate on a physical object like a coin and you can put your awareness into uh, a random pebble that you find into a grain of corn into any uh, piece of a random piece of plastic you pick up and you can test it out on anything now to do some of the extra healing and the, and the group entangled object, which is special because now with thousands of people adding their energy to it, the pendant is something special. But no, you, you can run energy into any kind of physical object and test out all the experiments in my book without owning a pendant. No, please, we don't, you don't need a pendant to experiment with my book at all. Fabulous. Um, Richard, do you have the books available in Dutch or French? They will be translated. The uh, foreign publishers have already expressed interest and contracts have been signed. And so they are going to be translated in time. And also Chinese and Japanese and many other languages. Quantum Touch is in 17 languages, so expect the same or thereabouts for the new one. Okay. That's great. Um, uh, distance healing. Could you talk a little bit about distance healing? Yeah. Uh, in the Quantum Touch and the Quantum Touch uh, New Human book, I speak about distance healing, uh, where when you learn how to run the energy, you can imagine the person between your hands, and you could either like if I was working on somebody's shoulder, I, some people like to hold a pillow between their hands and imagine that's the person's shoulder and that works really well. You can imagine the person is really tiny and now you've got this big powerful energy and you're running energy between your hands into them. You see, one of the things that, that was really clear in my experiments in this, in this book, Secret Nature of Matter, is that when you put your awareness anywhere, your awareness is actually there. So one of the experiments that I ran, and this is a distant healing experiment, was I was in an office, and I saw one of those post-it note pads, the really small ones, about that big, and I borrowed a post-it note, and I said to the person behind the desk, would you take this post-it note and hide it somewhere? Yeah, in a drawer, under a book, wherever, just so I don't know where it is. Meanwhile, I'm over here measuring somebody whose hips are really far out of alignment. Well, now that the post-it note is somewhere where I don't know where it is, I meditate on the post-it note that I just seen a moment ago. And I'm giving it energy, but I don't know where it is. This is distant healing. And then once I had meditated on it for 10 seconds or less, I said, all right, t take the post-it note from where you hit it and touch this person with it. And she did and she became un aligned instantly. So wherever you're bringing your awareness, you are actually doing, have the potential for doing distant healing. You see, all these human abilities are so natural to us, or else we couldn't do them. But that brings up a really interesting question is, how come we have abilities that we're just discovering now? If it was evolutionary, it would have to be something that developed from the past. So my theory is that we're receiving gifts from the future that we have not yet gift unfolded. We haven't unwrapped these gifts yet and discovered who and what we really are. Because I believe that ultimately we are spiritual beings and we're evolving into our true self. So that's, that's how I see the, the larger picture. Excellent. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, some of the questions are, are duplicates of others. Um, yeah, you talked about distance healing. 
Does it work when you send healing energy to people who aren't aware of this happening? And if so, what about free will? Yeah, we all have free will. And so when I send energy to a person who may be unconscious or unable to say yes, that they would like to receive it, or they're in another country and I have no way of reaching them, but I know they were in an accident, I always ask that the energy be used for the highest good. Their higher self will filter the energy. Now, let's talk about free will for a second. Sometimes our own higher self, in my opinion, intervenes and stops healing from working for a higher purpose. So there was a friend of mine who had horrendous sciatica pain. And she couldn't sleep at night because the pain was so great and she would cry in bed because the pain was so bad. And I, tr I thought, well, sciatica is usually pretty easy with quantum touch. So five minutes of quantum touch didn't even make any progress. So I said, okay, forget that. Let's go to the emotional causes. So we found the emotional cause with self-created health. I gave her some homework to do to release the old anger and hurt that she was hanging on to. And she slept like a baby ever since. So sometimes you actually have to get to the deeper level. But quantum touch is usually a great answer, except when it isn't. And then we like to go to a deeper level of that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, um, Mimi is asking whether you work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I have, I'm not doing that at this time, but I'm doing a lot of casual experimental sessions, but not, I don't have a private session uh, practice because it would be overwhelmed with too many people wanting to yeah. get sessions from me. And I want to point out that I, am a, I have been a pioneer in energy healing, and I've been doing it for a long time, and I'm very competent. But I see sometimes first-day practitioners doing things I've never done, like taking a bunion and reshaping the calcification. I've never done that. I see practitioners doing things I've, that astound me. Would we say that the Wright brothers were the best pilots? Hardly, but they were pioneers. I'm, I'm a pioneer. I'm, I'm exploring territory, but I don't find myself to be an exceptional uh, practitioner. Bob Rasmussen was an exceptional practitioner. That was the man that taught me how to do this stuff. I watched him dissolve kidney stones and take a woman from high fever. I mean, I saw some crazy stuff, but no, I'm not a great practitioner and, and I don't have a private practice. And I find my energies are best spent in teaching, writing, discovering, and inspiring. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's really tricky. The questions are coming in as I'm trying to read one and it keeps moving the- uh, Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes it- screen on me. And I'm like, yeah. let, me, let me just um, share something for a second um, while- yeah, I'm reading. If for those of you who just came into the podcast and you haven't yet gotten the book, um, if you do buy the book at the secret nature of matter.com, you can have your choice for free of either the uh, basic, the classic quantum touch video workshop, which is an entire weekend week <laughs> workshop that we've sold for $97 and teach you all about quantum touch, the basic stuff, or you can get a workshop called The Art of Youthing, which is about slowing, potentially stopping, or even reversing the aging process. And if you're wondering, I turn 70 next year. So I'm, I'm working on it. I don't think I've reversed it yet, but I've absolutely slowed it down. And I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life physically. I'm hitting the golf ball further than ever. And uh, on a good day, I can shoot uh, subpar. So that's not likely for someone who's chronologically my age, but biologically, I ain't that age, okay? So that's, that's where that is. So you can just go to that website, secret nature of, the secretnatureofmatter.com, and sign up and get a, a free workshop. And if you buy two books, you get both workshops. Yeah, that's fabulous. And then remember that after you do that, you will receive a promo code that will give you $30 off the pendant. So we've got a number of people asking how can they get a pendant, order the book, then uh, you'll get a promo code that'll give you $30 off dependence, and we're shipping those worldwide. Um, Barbara is asking, how yeah. long do you meditate on an object, uh, the, the pennies? For how long does it take to meditate on an object to cause the effect? 
Ah, uh, five, six seconds, 10 seconds. Okay. It's not like hours. It happens very, very quickly. And then when you have two objects that are charged, you just touch one to another to transfer the information. Wow. Um, Michael's asking, um, have you heard of any negative effects with the pendants? No. Oh, well, I wouldn't say it's a negative effect, but one person said he had all these injuries and when he put the pendant on the injury, it hurt more temporarily mm. as it was transforming the, the condition, but then the pain would go away. So he, he put it on, uh, one woman said she was very sensitive to the pendant and, and, and she only looks at it or holds it for like five or 10 minutes at a time because it's too intense for her. But what I've seen is that over time, people become more and more acclimated to it and then they can wear it or they can hold it longer or they can engage it. But what I would suggest when you get your pendant is engage with it. In other words, hold it in your hand, look at it, breathe deeply, infuse it with your deepest love, gratitude, connection to source, just, and then look at it and, and receive whatever you're asking for. I want to feel more gratitude is a good one. And just breathe into it and see if you can start feeling the connection with your experience of gratitude or the way it can share that vibration with you. In time, I haven't told the group this yet, but over a period of like the next six months, I'm going to really work with the newsletter and I'm going to have people start to put in their peak experiences. So when somebody has the best day ever, I'm going to have them put that joy and that exuberance into it. Um, we've had one man was teaching Tantra classes and he put sexual ecstasy into the pendant. So all these pendants now have the vibration of that. So there's whatever is wonderful in your life. We're going to create this extraordinary human library of wonderfulness through these things. So like I say, it's a, an entangled talisman that I've never heard of existing previously in the world. Mm. Um, we've had a, a few people ask, hang on, I'm gonna find the question again because it keeps jumping around on me. If, um, if, if uh, Richard would be willing to send energy to us all on the call. Oh yeah, I'd be glad to. Let's do that now. Okay, so I'm, I'll do it out loud so you can hear what I'm, I'm thinking and doing. So first off, I'm just kind of like imagining all the people in the various parts of the world who are listening to and watching this uh, webinar. And I'm just kind of like getting a feel for all the people out there with intent, connecting to my higher self, asking everybody to be brought together. Okay. All right. I'm just kind of like turning my head as if I'm looking at all of the people. This is sort of like my own biological way of kind of like, oh, kind of pulling it all together. I can lift my energy up a little higher. And I'm going to merge everybody in my mind into one iconic being. That feels pretty good. Now I'm going to send, okay, now I'm going to have everybody put their awareness in their heart chakra and feel how you know how to love, adore, cherish, gratefulness, Whatever it is, just put your awareness in your heart chakra and feel that love. And now I'm going to add some energy to the group heart chakra. Let it expand through your whole body. Go to all the chakras of your body. There it is. Move all through your whole body now. Coming down to the top of your head.
Ah, I bet some of you felt something there. Right. Um, will the pendants suffer when they're being sent abroad and having to go through security x-rays? Nothing affects it. This is one of the big themes that I brought forward. I boil them in, you can boil objects in water, nothing happens. I can put it in a microwave oven, run it through, I've gone through security x-rays. I, I can't figure, okay, here's the only thing I think you can do, okay, Here's my suggestion about how not to lose the information in your pendant. Don't melt it. <laughs> okay, that's it. You can you could run over it with a car. You could smash it with a hammer. Nothing's gonna make this thing stop being entangled. The woman's finger is still holding the energy a year later. <laughs> it's like. I don't, okay, it's easy to put awareness into an object. It's really hard to take it out once it's there. As I said, it seems that all objects are made of subatomic God stuff because they're all able to hold this energy information consciousness. And then with a little bit of intent, they're transferred to a person or another object. And so I'll tell you, if this stuff if this work actually gets researched in my lifetime, this would change fundamental beliefs about science. And please get on our mailing list, quantumtouch.com, because there's gonna be a lot of news and discoveries about these pendants and about what's in the book. And there'll be new, to, new things to learn, and I'll report them as we do that. And also, uh, I might as well let you know, a new project, is that I'm, I'm working with a filmmaker now, and we're gonna start working on a new mo a documentary we're gonna call The Galileo Project. And the idea is what would happen if somebody had visible, teachable, robust, visible, you know, paradigm changing information, how would entrenched scientists, uh, philosophers, and other people deal with this information? Would they be willing to look through an unfamiliar telescope? or would their cognitive dissonance be so great that they have to run away and be in denial? And so we're eventually gonna do a crowdfunding on this project, but we're gonna, I'm gonna fund it until we have a good sizzle reel, and then we can show you what this thing looks like and uh, get you on board to hopefully help us fund this, this movie. But one of my life goals and passions is to help shift the dominant belief about reality. The belief that, you see, people believe their love isn't valuable. They believe their love doesn't have any impact. And if you think about who hurts you the most in your, in your life, it's somebody who made you feel like your love wasn't important, didn't have any impact, wasn't valuable. Always we're hurt when we feel like our love doesn't matter. And your love truly matters. And the secret nature of matter actually shows that energy healing is real because we can do these things. This is energy healing when you touch somebody with a pendant because it untwists their posture. And, it's, and by the way, on those videos, um, the quantum touch pendant demonstration videos that I have on YouTube, some people experience their neck pain disappear. Some people had uh, the cranial, I mean, the occipital pain disappear. One person uh, was able to bend over suddenly and couldn't bend over before. Someone else had coccyx pain disappear. Someone had uh, shoulder stuff spontaneously just from the touch of the pendant. So there's many other kinds of things besides the posture changing, by the way, which is good for your gait. It's good for exercise, good for uh, injury prevention. It's, um, it's really valuable stuff, but I don't talk about that much. I'm just so fascinated just to have something clear to show. Richard, do you ever run energy in your golf ball? Uh, no, but I've been working with running energy into the target uh -huh. to, to get the ball to go where I want it to go. And I've had two holes in one, so I may be working. So we'll see. <laughs> That's awesome. That doesn't happen to many people, two holes in one. Uh, Diane's asking, I've come across the notion of quantum entanglement in quantum yes. biology. Do you think... Your work fits into this model. Yeah. 
uh, quantum entanglement is where they take two photons or electrons that are joined together with the same spin and they separate them at the speed of light and no matter how far apart they are, the instant you observe one and notice it has perhaps an upward spin, the other one instantly will be seen having a downward spin. And they, Einstein hated this. He vehemently disliked this whole thing and he called it spooky action at a distance that was the term he used for it and conscious entang i mean quantum entanglement has caused thought leaders to believe that we must live in a simulation because as materialists they have to believe everything that's physical can be weighed measured or put into a formula it has a physical explanation and Part of my message is it doesn't have to have that physical explanation. Okay, I'm getting visited again here. This is Debbie. So um, what I'm showing, oh, and by the way, Elon Musk, who I very much respect for so many wonderful things, he suggests that the odds that we live in a, in a simulation are billions to one that it's true. But instead of a simulation being by advanced aliens or human beings who have created this whole world so they can see uh, Honey Boo Boo, the Kardashians, and Donald Trump, and all this other craziness that's going on around us. <clears throat> Instead of it being a simulation by advanced humans to watch Barney the Purple Dinosaur, perhaps I would suggest that the Vedanta philosophy is more accurate suggesting it is a simulation but not the way they think it's an illusion it's an illusion of spiritual nature it's all maya they call it and so it all is illusionary physical stuff because the reality is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience as uh Talar de chardin had suggested we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And by the way, in, in The Secret Nature of Matter, I list like 35 or 40 arguments about everything's pointing eventually to this being a spiritual reality. And quantum entanglement has so baffled the scientists to get them to stretch their idea of reality so far as to assume that advanced aliens are creating this as a simulation. But conscious entanglement is a breakthrough that allows us to understand the reality from a whole new perspective. Let's take about three or four more questions and then I think it's, it'll be time to wrap this up. Uh, okay, I'm not hearing you if you're saying something. Yeah, it's because I had the mute button on because I was... Okay, well, I saw your lips moving. typing like crazy trying to answer these questions. Um, Dilek asks, I would like to know the basic breathing techniques while charging items or healing. Uh, it's all explained in the book, but essentially you can use any deep breathing technique. Mm -hmm. But I have some specific ones that work well. You can just start with a 4-4 four, four breath. Four counts in, four counts out will work perfectly well. Yeah. Um, a number of questions are around... Um, dealing with emotional issues or even uh, dark forces. Uh, okay, let's talk about dark forces. Yeah. Uh, basically irrelevant. If you focus on your love and connection to source, it's thousands of times more powerful than any woo-woo bad stuff out there. So I wouldn't really give it pay much attention. I just focus on what you love and what you want and the darkness that I'd be concerned about is the, un is the suppressed anger in your own life and the suppressed sadness and the suppressed hurt. To release yourself of that pain and suffering that you're still holding on to and to release that old rage and pain because that, un that suppressed anger causes a lot of diseases in your body. And so the healthiest thing that a person can do is to release their old anger and hurt and then start finding things that that bring them joy and love and gratitude wonderful um Carrie's asking about self-creating or self-created health um yes. is that one of your books 
it's the next book. It hasn't been written yet, but it's, I've been so busy with this one. That one's going to be coming. And uh, there are instructors around the world. If you go to the Quantum Touch site, who teach live classes. And it's better taught as a live class because I may have one coming up that would be like online, uh, a self-created health class. You can check the calendar. I don't really remember if, if it's been scheduled or not. But otherwise, we've got teachers in many countries around the world teaching self-created health. And uh, it's really cool because people know exactly what step they're on and they know what they need to do next because it's all mapped out very clearly. How do you go from this step to the next step to the next step? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for those questions we haven't gotten to yet. We have a lot that we still get, didn't get to, although I think you've answered many of them uh, through other questions. Yeah. Closing words? Uh, thank you so much for coming on to this call. I know it's, it's some of you are in odd hours where you're up very late or very early and uh, appreciate you being here so much. And I'll tell you, I am so inspired by my new book. I never thought I would write this book. I never imagined these things were possible. And every time I pick it up and, and read some of the stuff I have in there, I can hardly believe that this came through me and I'm ever grateful that that happened. And I just want to remind everybody that your love has more impact than you know. It's more valuable than you know. And as we start to appreciate the secret nature of matter, and we start to understand that our love is a real thing, then we, we value it more. And all the solutions in the world that involve compassion, because that, if, if compassion was our priority, we could never have a starving child on earth. We could never have the suffering that we see on the planet. We couldn't have a war. We couldn't have uh, the bad behavior that we see around us. So thank you all so much for being here today. And uh, it's been a real delight to share this time with you. And I hope you uh, take this work further. And, and by the way, one final thought is that when I wrote this book, I felt like, oh my God, I found a little keyhole, SPA, spontaneous posture alignment with which to look through. And I made it outside and I've gotten as far as the mailbox. But I don't know what is beyond my experiments that I ran. And I have a very limited imagination. I only came up with the ones that I thought of. But I'm really hoping that all of you or some of you will take this much further and explore things that I haven't even thought about yet. And let us know because this is just version one this is just the the first version of this book who knows what the third edition is going to look like because hopefully there'll be things in it that i've never dreamed of and maybe you're the one to discover it and the door is wide open for discoveries now because who knows where we're going to go so thanks again so much everybody i really appreciate your time yeah thank you everyone bye for now